If you're an old hack and you think you deserve more respect, I'm sorry to tell you, you simply do not deserve it. Opening governance can explain four things in this speech. First of all, why this is an internal generation of people and why this idea helps no one. Secondly though, why people are in a counterfactual able to change and why it's more likely to happen when this idea does not exist. Third of all, why it is unfair to report an obligation on people to care more about others than themselves. And finally, why this leads to the existence of a harmful counter on blank root over the number of arguments. Great bits of setup before I start that though. First of all, to answer the question of what it means to be more sensitive, we would simply suggest this means you are more likely to get upset when faced with the same objective communication or the same objective signaling from someone else. We, as we'll explain later, this mainly comes from, for instance, the way that you read in or find offence in statements. Not necessarily because there is some magically internal sensitivity which you might have. For example, finding abruptness to be an, 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 sorry, finding abruptness to signal anger where, for instance, others would not. We'll explain how that's likely to exist later on. But secondly, we we'll suggest that to be more sensitive than average means that you exist outside of the vast majority of people because obviously, like obviously, a trait are Point. normally distributed. So this is like the top 2% of sensitivity, not people who fall into that middle ground. But finally, this idea means that people always assess other people more. The way this idea works is it says that you should think about other people's sensitivity first and then your own needs and sense yourself on the basis of that. First argument, to explain why this is just an internal generation of people, and that they will find offence no matter if this norm exists or not. And that is because this is about a set of thoughts which you extrapolate from things that you hear. That is, that the off edge might be like, no, this is just you being more sensitive which is why you hear the same thing and feel more offense. But the question that they must answer is how you get from hearing that thing to the state of being offensive. We would explain that the reason you end up feeling more offended is just often because of the assumptions you make about the meaning. The way in which you Point. read in and determine the unknowables of that communication in a way which you are always biased to assume is bad against you. For instance, this is because you are insecure and you assume that your position in society is worse than it is and thus the logical corollary of that is that people are always being meaner than they would seem to be. Or alternatively, you assume there is a baseline level of malice in society against you and no matter what people say, you will always assume that malice exists and therefore no matter how they tailor the way that they talk to you, you will always likely feel offended. This explains why the changes in this changes in communication, which is brought about by this idea, do not make everyone feel better. Because they will just continue to search for the same reasons to be offended, the same ways to extrapolate out malice in the communication they receive. But additionally, to so point out that about this, if this idea, sorry, where this idea exists, people's standards merely change. And that's because if you are communicated to in like less, I guess, abrupt or more caring ways, the fact that you are still insecure, the the fact that you still assume there is malice in this world means that the standards that you expect to demonstrate that malice or the point at which you are satisfied that the person who's talked to you in a malicious way simply goes down because you are not suddenly no longer insecure. You still feel bad about yourself. You just change the way you interact with people, which explains generally why any benefit that the offense brings about people generally feeling better does not exist. If you don't believe that, there's two further preemptive reasons we'll explain why people are still going to feel bad even in the world where this idea exists. Just that first of all, people obviously differ and how they understand what is polite. Even if this idea coerces you to attempt to be polite, the fact that people's interpretation of communication is inherently subjective, depending on your upbringing, depending on your experiences, suggests that people are in general bad at doing this. But second of all, which is suggest that this is obviously exacerbated when you go to cross-cultural communication, where it's even harder to understand people's subjective interpretation, what is what is not polite, which should, should suggest you this is a hugely inefficacious norm. With that out of the way, why is this norm harmful for people's lives? First thing we're going to explain is why this stops people from changing and addressing the root problems, which leads to them feeling insecure, which leads to them feeling bad about them bad about themselves. This is a huge benefit of side opening government. This is the only way that people can change and stop feeling offended in this society. The first reason is because this idea suggests that society owes you an obligation to care for you, and therefore, as, an ex as a corollary of that, that you do not have an obligation to try and fix yourself. That is because it tells you that it's not you that is the reason that you are like feeling bad or you end up taking offense. That is something objectively true in the way that people communicate to you. But for all the reasons in my previous argument, we will suggest A, this is fundamentally untrue, but B, as as a result of that, you are actually able to change. Because, for instance, you are able to do things like second-guess yourself when your immediate reaction is to assume malice. You ask yourself, are they actually being mean to them? You ask them, are you being mean to me? Rather than importing this obligation of them to perfectly communicate your size, which for all the previous reasons we would suggest is impossible. But second of all, this idea suggests that it is impossible to change. It suggests not that the reason that you are upset is because of some internal trait of yours. It suggests that the reason you are upset is because someone else was insufficiently kind to you, that someone else was insufficiently insufficiently careful, which not only encourages you not to change, but suggests that change is impossible, which is why you do not engage in the kind of practices which would actually allow you to feel better in this world. If you care about people not being offended, this is the only part to secure people actually changing. Closing.
being meaner to people is deeply insufficient to winning the debate because you also have to prove this is a uniquely effective strategy that could not be replaced by other forms of effective change. But look, I'm sorry, I actually just don't understand what you mean by being mean to people. Oh, anyway, Matt, yeah, sure. Uh, you can't just prove that this might make people do something if there are other ways to do it that make people not feel shit. This isn't your burden. Well, like, our first argument explains why people don't feel shit. Our second argument explains why the alternatives aren't engaging. I'll listen to your extension. Third argument, to explain why this is unfair, why this causes a huge amount of suffering for people who are not in the small minority of people, but who, like, well, as we explained, don't even benefit from this norm. We would note that people are naturally likely to be reasonable for a few reasons. First of all, that people probably just do have a baseline empathy, which means they're not going to go out of their way and be a dick to everyone that they see. But second of all, obviously people have a set of practical benefits from not being actively rude. For instance, not everyone hating you, not everyone assuming that you're a terrible person, which means that in absence of this norm, it's not like everyone has suddenly become mean and suddenly become unreasonable. What this means is that all the norm actually does is it stops people from expressing their own desires and own cares in a way which is useful, because this idea necessarily forces people to self-censor when they believe that it's of the obligation that's on them to care for other people's sensitivities. And if you believe that they are unable to do so, this explains why people self-censor indefinitely, because they're never satisfied and people never stop being offended. This means that people are not able to advocate for their own needs, they aren't able to advocate for their own boundaries, which not only is terrible for their quality of life principally and practically, but is a harm which goes further, because when they do that they feel guilty, they feel like they are the problem, they question why they are not able to be a good person, and obviously this is a large amount of suffering that is avoidable in this debate, which we obviously not want to happen. But second of all, we would suggest that people should not be free from caring about others for the mere fact that they are sensitive. That is, that if you are the kind of person that does read into the words of others, that is not a reason why you should be protected from listening to other people. You should not be able to wield that as a tool to justify the reasons that you shut down other people when they try to establish their boundaries. It allows you to get off from listening to them and caring to them and caring about what they say because you merely assume that they are being malicious. But finally, insofar as all this analysis is true, we would explain this leads to a harmful counter norm because when people are dissatisfied and when people are frustrated by these sensitive people who they perceive as getting off easy on society, so I see when you get this kind of counter norm, people being intentionally more aggressive as an attempt to get engaged in revenge. We would suggest people can fix this trait. I'm so proud to propose. That speech was just seven minutes of why being a stoic is good. And we do not think that it is. Because when you have an eating disorder and are a teenager, someone can say something so small and it can trigger you for weeks and for months. And we think that you should just be more gentle to these types of people. We think if someone cries easily, you should act in a way that is sensitive to them. We think that you should take their feelings into account. We think that you should adapt the words that you use with different types of people, because in a world that is shit and depressing, we ought err on the side of kindness, and that is what we support on opening opposition. Firstly, why do we always this group of individuals? And second of all, how do we improve the interaction between people in society? Firstly, why do we owe it to these people? The first thing I want to explain is a few reasons why you are like this. Because that case assumes that everyone that is sensitive has a victim complex, and that is not true. There are so many other reasons why you might respond disproportionately to something. One, you're someone who's introverted, like Eugene. Two, you're someone who's on the spectrum, like me. Three, you have trauma. Four, you're part of the minority group. Five, you're insecure or anxious. All of those things can mean that you respond in ways that maybe the average person would not. Why do we think this is the case? Because when life is hit you hard, you respond in a sensitive way. But when your brain is wired a bit differently, you respond in a sensitive way. But even just for the average person that's going through the ringer, maybe they want someone to be a little bit less abrasive in the way that they speak with them. But the other thing that we would notice is that the way that people's sensitivity manifests is just differently. Sometimes you're quiet, sometimes you're insecure, sometimes you're less likely to express your opinions. And all of those things are valid responses, but people ought to tailor their response to those individuals at the point when you realise that someone might respond in a way that is not what you were expecting. People can be broken down by society, people's brains can be different, and we ought to respect that. Second of all, how do we think people usually behave? And the thing that we're going to posit here is that this response is just a correction for the inequalities and inequities that exist within society, given the fact that the average tendency of the average punter is to not be gentle. Why? One, it takes more time to be gentle, so people likely do the faster thing, which is to say fuck off, rather than to explain why they're annoyed at you. Second of all, people are generally selfish and care about their own goals. But thirdly, the social narrative is to be extroverted and to be bro and to be funny. And often all of those things mean that you're less likely to be sensitive because it's easier to fit in if you're extroverted than if you're introverted. But secondly, we note the fact that in society, those who are more sensitive are likely to speak less 
This corrects for the fact that you are disproportionately underrepresented if you are someone who takes things on more strongly. And maybe that is because you have a victim complex some of the time. We think a lot of the time it is just because you are slightly shyer or slightly more introverted. And yeah, maybe that makes you a bit of a sook, but I think sometimes it's okay to have a bit of a sook and for people to respect you and respond in a way that's going to benefit you. Finally, how do we think that people are, how, how, how do we think people are going to respond to this? Firstly, how do sensitive individuals respond if people are abrasive to them the way that Sam wants to treat them? The first thing that we know they do is they do things like shut down, so they disengage socially because they feel scared, they opt out of situations because they're worried someone's going to harm them, and yeah, maybe sometimes that's them being a bit of a pussy, but we know the fact that sometimes they just feel like it's not worth it to engage in that social interaction because they feel like they're going to be spoken to in a way that unsettles them. Second of all, they put the blame onto themselves because when individuals are not treated in a way that is gentle, their automatic assumption is that they've done something wrong rather than that person is just oppressive. So if it's not true what Sam says, which is, well, they'll learn from it and get better. No, they won't because they don't realise that this is about that person and not about them. Their automatic assumption is they need to correct their behaviour. But the other thing we're positive is why should they correct their behaviour? It's unclear to me as to why introverted people need to become more extroverted in order to fulfil the norm that society says that they should. But the last thing we would explain to you is that these people just should not owe it to society to make themselves better and easier to deal with. Secondly, how do they respond to when people treat them gently in two ways? Firstly, it makes them feel heard and understood. And maybe that does mean they change their behaviour in the future because more positive interactions lead to them becoming more social and lead to them becoming less sensitive. But that is not even the burden that we wish to fulfil because we believe that you're a sensitive person, you are allowed to be a sensitive person, and that is not something that you should ought to correct for. But the second thing is it probably means that you are more comfortable to speak in scenarios where you otherwise would not be. This counteracts a society that is selfish and a society that is blunt, and if we're able to prove that incredibly sticky benefit on opening opposition, we should win this debate. The next thing I'm going to do is explain why your interactions are better, they're more positive, they're kinder, and they leave people wanting more rather than having to escape. But first, I'll take Ali. Sensitive people and their actions can cause harm, but requests or critiques that are reasonable are perceived as more of an attack than they are. How can they ever get the opportunity to change if people feel scared to ask? So I think the first thing is that I don't think responding in a way that is abrasive will cause the change that you suggest it will. Because I think that if someone critiques you and you respond badly, the way that you then self-improve isn't through that critique. It's through a gentle aversion of that conversation. We don't need to support never critiquing people. That is absolutely not our burden. We support the ways in which you critique individuals, the ways in which you change your language to be more emotive, to peer into them. And yes, obviously that is frustrating when you have a conversation with someone and you feel like you're having to stoop down to them. But that is society, that is what we are a part of, and sometimes it's frustrating, but it is better to appease those people and make them feel better about themselves. We should obviously be kind. Why do we think interactions are better on our side? The first thing to explain is that being gentle is far easier than this government bench thinks that it is. The barrier to entry to be slightly more gentle to people is so, so low. It is just using soft language, it is quieting your voice, it is perhaps being less targeted and aggressive than you otherwise would. All of those things fulfill the burden that we have of side opposition. But even if it means going even more extreme and petering towards them, that is still something that we think is a relatively low barrier to entry that most people can engage in. Why do we think that this causes positive effects on society? Four reasons. One, it means that people are more likely to understand individuals who are different to them and empathise. Two, we think it is good cross-culturally, opposite to what Sam says, because it means that if some societies value politeness, for example, it is better when you can understand that some people, that is the norm, and that is the way that they engage. And they're not responding in a sarcastic, growy fashion. Is it because they don't like you? It's because that's not the norm that exists in their society that values sensitivity. Thirdly, it means you're less likely to have a cycle of bad interactions. But finally, you're less likely to have unproductive, confrontational situations that don't cause about any change. The problem with that case, as is correctly identified in the POI from our closing, is that they never prove why these kind of interactions change these individuals for the better. But secondly, they never prove why these individuals ought to change in the first place. I agree, having a victim complex is annoying, but for some people it is just the way that their brain is wired. It is okay if you want to have a soup on Twitter sometimes after you lose a debate. That is something to support on our work.
Opening opposition does a great job explaining why it's bad to be mean to people and why it is good to be nice to people in general. But this was not a debate about whether on net you should be a mean person or a nice person. This was a debate about one very specific norm that obviously interacts with a range of other norms that already promote niceness and kindness in general. That is, norms of civility in the vast majority of public spaces, desires to be liked and get along with people by not upsetting them and being genial. Norms that, you know, like in general, people dislike making other people upset or hurting them and want to avoid those kinds of disagreements. And the fact that, particularly if this is a debate about friendships, you have very strong reasons to want to look after your friends and make sure that they are okay. On both sides, people are likely to be quite nice in general. This was a debate about instances where people were sensitive and took offense when you weren't trying to offend them, when you were being nice, but nonetheless they were able to read offense into it. For example, think about what OO tells you. If someone has an eating disorder, maybe they are triggered by something like mentions of food or mentions of dieting, but that is not you being impolite in a context, that is just you making a comment. If someone is triggered or reads in ill intent into something you say because you were abrupt, that is not you being not nice, that is someone reading something in. If someone sees malice in a statement where there is none, that is not something that is solved by being what? nicer. Because it's quite possible that you're already being quite nice, and it's possible that you can be extremely nice and still, for example, say something that triggers someone, or that someone could read malice into it, or that someone could read ill intent into it, which is why just being nicer does not solve the problem in this debate, and this team just saying it is better to be nice does not address the concern of what if people who are sensitive are upset by things you say, and our contention therefore is very simple. Because the offense taken is internal, because it is subjective, it is very ineffective to try and get people to behave in a different right. way, because it is very unclear how you should behave that would avoid that offense in the first place, and because even behaving very well, as nicely as possible around people, does not militate the harm that this team says would occur, which is our case, they do not respond to it, and they are out of the round. We explain to you, sensitivity is not like you have less armor or HP and just like normal remarks do more damage to you. It was an internal state of mind. It was you reading in. It was because you were insecure or you had shame or because your brain operated differently, you did read those kinds of things in. The implication of that was that it does not explain why any of those things changed on their side, particularly in the context of people having different styles of communication, particularly in cross-cultural con context or just context of different group norms, like debaters tend to be quite aggressive. That might be very weird to someone who's not from that particular norm, but it's not a reason to believe that people are being impolite. Which means even if people do internalize this norm, you would require people to believe that the set of things they would need to do by being more polite and gentler to these people aligns with the set of things Point. that would meet the needs of those particular people, with no explanation given as to why that is, considering often it is very individualized and very distinct how those things are very likely to occur. Which explains precisely why this does not help those kinds of people. They say, well, if you were just gentler to people, then they wouldn't shut down and wouldn't feel bad, etc. I explain why this is not true. But think about the harm that occurs on the other end. I.e., when people now feel that they need to walk around eggshells around you, or they feel they're very likely to upset you, and then it will be their fault for doing so, that's when they just avoid you. That's when they isolate you. you they exclude you. They refuse to have conversations with you because they feel like having a conversation with you is a risk. That is the far bigger harm in the debate. The people who are neurodivergent, people who are on the spectrum, people who are more sensitive just get excluded from society, find it so much harder to make friends, find it so much harder to fit in because they're perceived as needing special treatment, they're perceived as snowflakes, they're perceived as being difficult to get along with, and so people just do not bother. If you believe this team that people are selfish, you should far more believe that they just don't take the effort to get along with people who are difficult to get along with than you believe the idea that they just go around being mean, which obviously has consequences in a way that this does not. That takes Exposing opposition out. What do we then explain to you? We provide a number of reasons to believe that this norm operates in a way that is deeply unfair. For that, uh, closing. So, if you believe that these people are somewhat annoying or difficult or they have problems, why wouldn't, in the absence of this norm, you just completely ignore them? Well, for the reason that there wouldn't be that much of a burden on you to deal with them in a way that is annoying. Like, the annoyance is generated when, for example, you feel really bad about an interaction with them because they get a bit upset. Like, often you don't even know that they're upset, right? Like, in our world, those people would change for the reasons we identify, and they'd be like, I feel like you're upset with me, are you? And you'd be like, no, and then you get along fine. It's only in their world where that person says that you've done something wrong to them, you feel really bad about that, you feel extremely guilty, then you feel like you have to self censor around them, that you feel the incentive to avoid them in that particular place, which is why that's likely to be distinct. 
Why is this really unfair to the vast majority of society? Some quick weigh here, 98% of the population, a far larger group of people, we would say many of these groups of people are also minorities, many of these people also have things going on in their lives. It's like, yes, many of these people are sensitive, are in some ways disadvantaged, but the vast majority of society is just a much larger group and you should care about them much more. One, we explain this makes them feel like they need to self-censor. Two, it makes them feel extremely guilty for things that they often cannot control, that are not their fault. And it's in principally wrong to just impose an obligation on people to feel really bad about things that they really cannot control. But additionally, this opens two really big harms in the debate. One is it's very easy to manipulate people based on this norm and claim, for example, people setting boundaries about what they feel is acceptable or about the way they want to behave is in some way violating your right to be treated better as an overly sensitive person. You can easily say, oh, I don't like it when you, you set those boundaries or don't want to talk to me in these contexts or, or you know, you don't want to do those particular things because that's not taking account of the fact that I am much more sensitive. But secondly, it's likely to apply in ways that are disproportionately disadvantageous to minorities because those are the people who are perceived as often being too aggressive. Those are the people in the context of women who often are not tolerated as being aggressive because when they do so, it's bitchy, which means that they're far more likely to be perceived as violating this norm of not treating people sufficiently gently. And this is like that have the most self-censoring on those groups who are already most prone to feel the need to self-censor because the way they engage with society is not accepted in the first place. What do we then explain? We point out it would be far better for these people to adopt coping strategies that would help them. Things like reconsidering whether or not ill intent or malice was meant, things like clarifying with the person, things like maybe engaging in meditation or deep breaths to cool off and release you know, emotion about the reaction the interaction that occurred and realized it wasn't quite that bad, that only occurs on our side. Because on their side, this norm says the burden is on society to change, and you ought not do that. But on our side, the reverse is true. You're more likely to go to therapy, you're more likely to read the wiki how blog on how to do these kinds of things. It's stuff you can work on on your own. And this is it's good, because it actually works in every circumstance. Like, actually having these coping strategies means that any time you are you know, triggered as, a, as an easily sensitive person, you're able to cope with that. On their side, it's very ineffective for society change because people don't know how to change, many people won't change, and it's very likely cross-cultural interactions are still bad. Additionally, we point out many people will just enjoy setting you off because they'll think the norm goes too far, restricts what they're able to do. Not allowed to say anything these days, well, I'm gonna be hyper-offensive and push back, which is exactly why this was a deeply ineffective policy. says that this debate is about the top 2% of people who are the most insecure. And I'm like, wait, the topic literally could not be clearer. It says more than average, as in 51% plus, <laughs> yeah? Like, this debate clearly happens on a spectrum that side open government wants to run all away from. They only want to talk about that top 2%, the, the most insecure individuals who have the eating disorder that Bella describes. But it is our case that incorporates the huge diversity of individuals that often are, just for instance, slightly more introverted, which absolutely, as Drew says, interpret more abrupt behaviours to signal anger. This is a type of individual that might not deserve as much gentleness, and we recognise that human beings are pretty smart. They tend to treat the people that are most insecure, the most sensitive, with the greatest amount of gentleness to respect their intentions. We recognise in this debate that that full spectrum, though, is important. That every single individual should be proud of the identity that they do have, and the sensitivity should be respected. We're going to make three arguments. <coughs> First is directly dealing with this opposition team, which is an explanation about why just on net, this causes less argument, it causes less acrimony, causes less hurtful relationships. Because we recognise, yes, that people will have to bite their tongue sometimes. Yes, they will have to sometimes keep their thoughts to themselves, but they can deal with it. It's not that bad. Like, genuinely, it is pretty easy to just be a little bit kinder and a little bit more gentle. Because it's not as if you're making a huge life-changing sacrifice to be like, I don't know, like best bosom pals with these people. It is literally just to be a little bit more considerate, to like not lash out or to not say things that you might ultimately regret a little bit later. And side opposition has three responses to this. The first is, is that, ah, oh, individuals have their own boundaries. It would be like, 
feel terrible to kind of just be nice and gentle to people? Like, what? No, the type of people that they describe that genuinely feel a little bit bad, like a little bit of guilt of saying something that is a bit gentle, the types of people that are genuinely quite conflict averse, right? That's why they're resulting to that type of behavior. They think they do that because they hate conflict. It is, yes, not particularly present to feel like a little bit like, oh, I have to bite my tongue here, but it feels even worse to then confront that person and say something that you don't feel particularly comfortable for. We think this is a lesser of two evils. It means that individuals choose the option that has the least conflict, even if it is a bit sub-ideal. Second, they say, oh, this will be hugely inefficacious because you try to be polite and you stuff it up. Like, guys, it is just not that hard. Like, genuinely, their solution to the problem of it's a little bit hard to be kind of polite is to just, like, not try, to just not be gentle, and to just be blunt off. Like, what? Like, your whole case of, like, you need to go through the stoic self-improvement, then walks into, ah, oh, let's not worry about trying to be a little more polite. This makes no sense. People can work it out, they can learn. It's not that difficult to be a little bit more considerate on a bit of a spectrum. But secondly, they say, ah, oh, and this is, the, I think, the core of their case. We're going to fix them, we're going to improve them, we're going to make them better people. And this, firstly, is in direct contrast to the entirety of the first argument that Dries made. Explaining that people inherently often react in quite a self-defensive manner. They listen to someone that is a bit abrupt, and they interpret it in a way that that person is angry. It is deeply unclear how you change fundamental characteristics of people's identity, of their upbringing, of the culture that they come from. No explanation, in fact, an explanation that defeats itself from side opposition. But believing none of that, you still have to believe this opposition team just has a whole bunch of like self-entitled people that think it's never their fault that they are so like you know like um insecure. I think there's three problems with this argument. First is this is the vast majority of people, as they explain, this is the top 2% of the most insecure people. Literally, Uday gets up there and has already explained to you why there are such significant norms for people to not be self-entitled in this fashion. From fans or family, from media, from teachers in their lives that seek to explain that this type of behaviour is a little bit problematic. We think that overwhelmingly people throughout their lives have faced this type of criticism. I think it's so like self-entitled itself to think that you are going to be that person that has realised that I just need to be say something in a little bit more of a blunt fashion and I'll be able to fix these people as if their parents or their family or their teachers have not been to try this in the first place. But secondly, if these individuals genuinely are self-entitled in the way that they describe, they certainly don't have the solution to that problem. And that is simply because they are probably self-entitled for a good reason. That often looks like past trauma that those individuals have faced, using this as a defence mechanism to retain some degree of their sanity. But even when that is not the case, it's probably something that is genuinely quite inherent to their character that those individuals themselves are proud of. I do not understand how you can significantly change these people by being a little bit blunter, yet alone how it breaks through this self-entitlement that has established a part of their character over their life. But last, if you genuinely believe none of this, I still think that gentle conversations act as the gateway for so much of what side opposition describes. If on the initial outset you have this slightly more blunt conversation, you know, speak your mind and tell this person that they're being a bit too insecure, it's more likely that they react badly to that when you are not initially gentle, when you do not have those initial conversations which are a bit more polite, then you might think are a bit unreasonable and you're being a bit too generous, but we still think are more important on next to good, get good favourable outcomes and good forms of communication. Where does the concept of white moves tears come from? Um, yeah, you guys can explain this one. I'm not sure if it's important today. Um, next argument I'm going to explain is, uh, I think the next big push, which is just like, ah, oh, you'll just exclude them. It's like you're walking around eggshells that you're, you perceive these people as a snowflake. I think there's two responses to this. First is to explain that this idea in of itself discourages people from doing that. It tells you, you are bad if you actively seek to exclude people because you yourself could not be a little bit gentler. We think that this idea, in fact, encourages people to not engage in the type of harmful behaviours that they describe. But it secondly just denies the fact that people are pragmatic all the time. He makes borderline jokes amongst friends that you wouldn't to other individuals. You recognise that maybe going drink for drink with your girlfriend isn't necessarily reflective of gender equality because you recognise that you treat different people differently based on how much more sensitive <laughs> or whatever different characteristics or traits that they have. And we say that people are smart, 
They don't exclude you. They instead recognise that there's a very reasonable discrepancy that you're a bit more sensitive and I should react and behave accordingly. But believing literally none of this, I do not understand why these people should change their character and their identity. We say you have a right to be proud of who you are. No matter how much Trotter wants me to, you know, get on the beers, I simply will not. And that is simply a character trait that I say, maybe I'm a little bit more insecure, that is totally fine. And we say, with a society that constantly encourages people to be a little bit more blind or looks down on people that are more sensitive. Like, literally, look at this audience reaction to when Bella said, I'm a little bit more introverted. Like, yeah, I am. I'm proud of it. And we say that individuals should be fully accepting and embrace that. And we say that this idea encourages and supports those individuals to be proud of that identity. And this is a hot norm, therefore, that actually makes and makes relationships worse, but it also denies something that is important to people and their expression that we should preserve. Not everyone in society is capable of wielding social norms to their own benefit. The most oppressed and sympathetic, sensitive people are fear that asserting their own vulnerability will ultimately see them ostracized because the people around them don't believe that their oppression is worth considering. So they do not build sensitive identities, or at least they don't characterize them as such because they fear that asserting the fact that they are sensitive will ultimately be damaging for them. The kinds of people who can build social norms like this one are those that experience some form of disprivilege, but are overwhelmingly, in the absolute sense rather than the relative sense, privileged within society. This is white women who use their victim status as women to victimize and shout down black men and women's angry calls for justice. Cis women who demand that trans women shouldn't share the bathroom with them because their sensitivity and their fear must be acknowledged. Two extensions from closing government. First, this bolsters pernicious political victimhood narratives, and secondly, this is transgressed primarily by neurodivergent and angry people, which causes them to bottle anger in a way that is ultimately destructive to the most victimized people. Thus, on political victimhood narratives, who can characterize themselves as sensitive? As I've already established, you need to have a level of oppression to a, or a level of sort of this privilege in society to be able to convincingly portray yourself as someone with a reasonable sensitivity <coughs> that other people should honor. But there is a double component to this, which is you need to have some sort of overall privilege in order to be able to signal that you are a sensitive person and reliably believe that other people will respect that preference. So you must not, in this instance, be a very vulnerable person because in that instance, I think the overwhelming fear is that telling someone that you're a black woman and that you ought, people will be sensitive to that most likely means that you are spying for acknowledging an oppression that other people in your social group and in your broader political class are unwilling to acknowledge or take seriously. So, as we've established, it's overwhelmingly people on the higher overall and absolute rank rungs of social oppression in the ladder and wielded against people who are lower. As I've established in cases like, for instance, white women's victimhood narratives, they wield against black women calling for justice. Cis women are doing so against trans women's calls for justice. And the effect of this narrative or norm is that people do not question these victimhood narratives where they exist. Minorities lower down on the social ladder are forced to self-censor, they're forced to sublimate their own desires and their own preferences in order to honor those of people above them on the social rungs. Trans people feel obligated now because of this to not offend the sensibilities of cisgendered women and therefore go to a, the, the bathroom of their own sex where they are more likely to experience violence, where they are more likely to experience transphobia. Black men have to bite the anger that they experience at very real and very sensible racial anger around white women lest they be branded as violent and have the police like. call on them. And that is a bad thing, not only for the reason that self-denying is a bad thing to do, it is regressive, but also because it sustains processes of oppression, because it sustains cycles of oppression in society that are deeply regrettable. But also, it makes oppressive arguments that are made by people who wish to reify processes of oppression much more persuasive. One, because it's harder to question people when you know, obviously, when you're characterizing yourself as a victim, when in reality you are an oppressor, this enables people to cloak themselves with their oppression in a way that actually justifies far more oppression being done in their name. But it's also far more, less likely that people feel comfortable in your space because they fear the victimhood narrative you will weaponize against them. They feel like, bad about asking loudly for trans rights around cis women. And that, this, I think, is the debate winning contribution. Because, first, it results in a critical characterization question that is absent from the opening part. Who should we deem as, and who do we deem as sensitive and able to express that sensitivity to this norm? It's overwhelmingly people who can 
punch down, who can use their social power to wield a social norm against another person, which I think interacts quite nicely with opening opposition. But also, the scale of the impact here is just larger. This is not just about how people feel, it's about how people um, like act to make emancipatory political arguments. Maybe, Point. you intuitively believe this sounds more speculative, you're unsure what kind of change result from this. But I, I don't think you actually all believe that. Like the central reason that centrists have aligned themselves with the transphobic right is that victimhood is seen as socially sensitive, rather than a nakedly self-interested attack on the rights of an oppressed group. And even if it were true that this norm affects policies, which I think it does quite substantially, it does not always change policies if regressively entrenches social hierarchies where it otherwise would not do so. Point. Which is deeply regressible. Let's take opening opposition. Yeah, if you dismiss a white woman and tell her to get over it, do you think she realises the error of her sensitive ways, or do you think she uses that as a tool to increase her victimhood? Without this norm, a white woman is less able to portray herself as a victim because this norm does not enable someone to do so. This is one method by which victimhood narratives are made more persuasive, this would diminish that. This white woman doing so would far more often now just be seen as a naked attack on an oppressed group rather than a legitimate expression that you are a victim. Let's talk about who transgresses this norm. Because it's overwhelmingly neurodivergent and angry people. Like, neurodivergent people are most likely to forget the social punishments, not interpret, I think, the quite nuanced claim that someone is more sensitive than another person and that they won't respond well to critique. And also, they are generally oppressed within society, so often feel as if they need to stand up for themselves when their needs aren't met, which means they're very likely to transgress this norm and feel it's social punishment. But also, I think generally angry people are likely to do so. Because in the heat of the moment, you forget the punishments of that social norm, and your anger feels more important than that. Why is this a bad thing? Because anger is volatile and destructive when it's bottled. To a point, this norm makes people bottle their anger, but at some point, that anger explodes. The first stage of bottling is harmful because it's psychologically onerous to suppress something that is deeply felt, that is something you think is quite important to you, but also you feel unable to talk to others about it. So you are forced to essentially feel as if that's not something that you ought to feel, and you feel bad even for feeling that anger. But eventually, that anger explodes. The trigger point, maybe that anger, that, that sensitive behavior of, of someone else's that you don't feel like expressing, eventually causes you to explode. You, you, you had enough, you, you're jacked with it. You don't consider that the social norms punishments might impact you. And, and I think those contexts are when, you, you have, if you are censored by your friend, I'm talking about food who has an eating disorder. Eventually, sometimes you just don't talk about it, but if that makes you feel angry to, to censor yourself, eventually you just do respond with explosive anger when they censor you one more time. And that is the kind of anger, that destructive, thoughtless, short-term, visceral anger that ends friendships, that causes people to have hate in their heart for other people. And I think that is deeply damaging and alters always the priority pretty fatally in this debate. Because uh, anger eventually expresses itself, it's just more destructive. <laughs> Every time this debate has a different conception of who matters. For opening government, it's the 98%. For opening opposition, it's 2%. For closing government, it's stupid poll packs. Uh, but the actual reality is this debate is about everyone, and the real, real harm of this narrative not existing is that it creates an incredibly bad normative shift about who deserves kindness and what it is that actually makes people valuable. I'm going to start with two brief responses to closing government's extension about political victimhood. The first problem is that it's deeply marginal. I'm pretty sure the reason that black men are overlooked is not because of white women, it's because of fucking racism, it's because of classism. There are so many other larger factors that actually stifle their voices and stop them from achieving political change. There are so many other reasons why they might be ignored. Uh, I don't really think it's an opportunity cost or even necessarily that white women's concerns are mutually exclusive to dealing with other structural factors of oppression. It's deeply unclear to me why this is an actual harm rather than just another group that we should care about to some extent. But secondly, I would just also point out that like anxious white women do exist. They do also presumably matter. I don't know why you would weigh them up against like other, other marginalised groups in society and try to evaluate which is more important, which is why I don't think that extension lands. Then we'll do the second extension of the world economic angle. So, the extension of political competition is very simple. This, this norm is necessary to create a society-wide normative shift about kindness and who is worthwhile. There's three premises you need to believe. The first is that there are lots of norms in society that tell people to be kind, but they rely on mutual reinforcement, right? This narrative about being kind to especially sensitive people depends on you believing that all people deserve kindness, depends on you believing that kindness is reciprocal and it's good to be kind to other people. The second premise you need to believe is that people often determine who they are kind to based on their perceived social value. 
That is why, for example, bosses can be mean to employees and people then see to be subservient to them. That is why, for example, people from dominant social castes, like Chad, can be mean to the Virgin because they don't perceive them as being that worthy of kindness and why that is not always a fully reciprocal relationship. And thirdly, it is probably true, as OG says, the counterfactual is not people being viciously, gratuitously cool. What that all means for this extension is very simple. This norm applies, in, and, 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 and this narrative is at its most potent, when people are trying to work out the nature of somebody they do not know that well. They are trying to work out how sensitive they are, what their concerns are, how valuable they are as a person, and how much kindness they are perceived to, uh, they are perceived to be you know, deserving of receiving from the person in making that interaction. The, with the existence of this norm that we're defending, there's four important things in those situations. The first is that it causes people to err significantly more on the side of caution in their interactions than what they say, which opening love to talk about, fair enough. Uh, secondly, though, and more uniquely, it tells people that they should not try and force their way to make people justify their sensitivity. It tells people that you, are not, that you should not be asking them, why are you sensitive? Are you sure this is a real concern that you have, or are you just a snowflake? It tells people, that, and this explains why the opening half flash of are these concerns legitimate or are they illegitimate and people being too soft is actually not important. It doesn't matter whether those concerns are real or not, uh, or real or not, because what this narrative does is tell people you shouldn't probe into people's lives and try to dig into their potential trauma. You should try to dig into what caused them to be that way, to try and find out and whether to find out whether they can justify to you why they are a person that is worthy of kindness, why they are deserving of other treatment. We think the act of trying to find out is in itself deeply harmful, which I think supersedes the OO harm, which is people might accidentally step in it if they if they're not sensitive. No, this tells, the absence of this narrative tells people they should be more willing to dig into people's past, more willing to ask them probing questions which are deeply uncomfortable and in some cases actively violate, violate people's concern, privacy and consent. Thirdly, we think that this norm signals to people that other people's concerns are legitimate and valid. So even if you might disagree about the importance of some particular issue they hold near and dear to their heart or some experience they may have, it tells you that you should not question this and it is, even if it is a subjective thing that as OG say might be technically objectively irrational, that is still valuable, that is still something that you do not have the right to question and undermine. But fourthly, I would also importantly, uh, no one, another thing I want to talk about the way this narrative is taught to people in society, we would say the most common way is from young, pe young people hearing it from their parents, like you should be nice to the quiet kid if you don't know what they're going through, which means that in the absence of this norm to correct for people's natural instincts and group behaviour and dynamics, it's very likely that kids who are quiet and sensitive or young people who are a little bit unusual, who are a little bit neurodivergent or atypical, are very likely not just to be not not, not just to be like not given this particular diligence, but to be actively disrespected, to be actively excluded, because they do not conform to these standards in society that tell them uh, that tell people what, that, what happens. And that is particularly bad at a young person level, because obviously that has huge consequences for people whose brains are very vulnerable, who are very emotional, who are very likely to be uh, you know, most affected by this isolation, by this harm. What happens in the counterfactual? We think, firstly, you get probed more in conversation, which is uncomfortable and deeply violating, so people can try and determine how worthy you are of kindness. Because in the absence of this narrative telling you that even people who might be a little bit unusual, who might be a little bit weird, who don't conform to your expectations of what a good social functional person is, you are much more likely to try and interrogate them and find out how genuinely, uh, you know, how genuine their situation is, rather than giving them an additional buffer, an additional margin of error in making sure you do not hurt those people. Secondly, people get their concerns disregarded far more readily. Thirdly, everyone is just much less likely to be kind in every circumstance because you don't know if someone is particularly sensitive or not. You don't know how sensitive, like what they've gone through. Which means this isn't just about you, you know, tell, giving tough love to the two percent of people that OG talk about. It's you are meaner to everyone because you don't give them the benefit of the doubt. You don't give that additional margin of error in the way you treat people because you are more willing to be sensitive. You are less willing to try and interrogate them about their problems. The final impact is that people is people just view others as less valuable in society for the reasons I've explained earlier about how it's strongly correlated to how kind how kindly you treat people. That also works in the inverse. If you're in a fair society that's meaner, you feel less about yourself and about the people around you, and that affects how you see them in terms of things like how deserving they are of political rights, etc. Okay. Our explanation of why people are never satisfied or safe for offence explains why you normalise an incredibly high level of censorship and defend it. This means you assume anyone censored is massively unagreeable and avoid them. Just far less than simply finding out how to accommodate them. I literally just think your case is fake. I'm sorry, I don't believe people self-censor so much when talking to other human beings that it's like no one is ever capable of change or discussing sensitive issues. Like, I don't know, debating is a pretty like leftist safe space circle joke a lot of the time, and we still have the ability to do fucking debates about Israel and Palestine. I'm sorry, I just don't think 
think is particularly a real concern, which should be weighed highly in the debate, compared to the far more certain impacts of everyone gets probed with questions, including vulnerable people, particularly at a young age, when they're unable to opt into those rules. In terms of weighing this extension, I would note that firstly, this extension affects not just the sensitive, not just the insensitive, you know, massive legends, and not just a very niche group of political communities like CG talk about, but everyone in society. Everyone in society is meaner, everyone in society is willing to probe into your past and ask you questions you could not possibly have consented to. But secondly, the scale of harm is far greater. Because it's not just being less kind, it's also seeing people as less valuable. It's also deliberately trying to assess their worth so you can assess how you should treat them, how much you should value them, how you should interact with them on a societal level. This narrative was necessary, this narrative was good, and this narrative was kind. We are close. <laughs> Sorry, Apple 
watch. Have to take their consideration, take their feelings into greater consideration, also have to feel comfortable enough to actually say it in the first place. They feel that it, they feel their emotions are that important, which is unlikely to be the case, given they already characterize those people as not wanting to explain it as well. The impacting of this argument is incredibly important because before you want to get involved in opposition's idea of interpersonal relationships, you actually need to prove that the people who would be benefited by this by taking care of their emotions are the people who are benefited by it. And I just don't think they ever prove it. But also, the type of people who are likely to weaponize these narratives, I think is also just indicative of a selfishness that makes you less likely to take on feedback when it is gentle. You do probably need things like direct critique from many different sources, rather than little gentle reminders that you're treating people poorly, because you've already elevated your own interests as above everyone else's. And also, gentleness is just not necessarily that effective of a way when you're dealing with people like this. Ultimately, it's incredibly important then that we've proven that this is not just people who are sensitive, it is people who perceive themselves who are sensitive, who instrumentalize that idea and weaponize themselves as sensitive, right. and those people are not necessarily commensurate to those who are actually sensitive. Secondly, talking about the political sphere, closing opposition says, well, there are definitely other reasons for racism. Yes, that is very true. This is a particular pernicious narrative, though, in being able to enforce racism in a way that silences people from being able to actually tackle it. Because now not only do people dislike what you say because you're a member of a marginalized group or minority group, they also dislike you because you are mean, because you are hurting their white friends' feelings for pointing out where they have been racist or where they have been transphobic in the past, and now that person is upset, you are not only a minority and not worth taking seriously on that ground, but you're a minority who does not necessarily act in a way that is acceptable in society as well. It's a preemptive way on scale and certainty here. Firstly, people from marginalized backgrounds' daily interactions are shaped by their identity and often take on a political undertone, which means that people are constantly dealing with microaggressions that Oscar points out in their speech, which means interpersonal relationships here have political dimensions, and right. political dimensions are founded in interpersonal relationships. So this stuff still does align with all of the metrics that you get from opening. If you believe interpersonal relations are important, the impacts of those in interpersonal relations are greatest when they're about people's own humanity in the first place. Sure, go ahead. This idea doesn't tell black men to never criticize white women. It tells people they should be gentle to some people because the sensitivities of most people are legitimate. Why are these white women so malicious and self-serving don't let us want people to be gentle to them? I mean, yes, they want people to be gentle to them. They don't have to be malicious for this to work. They could genuinely perceive themselves as selfish, but in doing so, it means that when they are critiqued for things that they do that are racist, either intentionally or unintentionally, they then stifle that critique by saying, you should not hurt my feelings, I am a little bit more sensitive than you, that means people cannot critique them in the same way. It doesn't have to be an intentional malicious action, it can still stifle things and stop people from acting in a way and talking about things that are important. But also, of course, as I said before, yes, this is the biggest impact on in the interpersonal sphere as well, because these are critiques that genuinely come down to people's sense of humanity and feeling comfortable with themselves. But also, I think it is just very important to point out that we explain to you that people take the critiques of marginalized individuals much more seriously, when they cannot just default to saying that those person is mean or that they have transgressed the social norm. At the point at which you are just pointing out racism and not being unfair to the sensitivities of the person who was rude to you in the first place, you're more likely to be taken seriously. Self-censorship is incredibly important in this debate, right? It is a much higher impact than what OG talks about, which is just interpersonal relations, because it is what the, it's the basis of what people's humanity is based on in the first place. But also, having discourse censorship and making people feel is that they cannot talk about Let's start with the responses to our extinction, of which there are four. Firstly, from opening government, they claim that you would have to normalise being respectful so much because you would always cater to people who are sensitive that you'd have to normalise really unwanted of respect. This is a silly claim because to buy this harm, you also have to buy that people are generally so nice to each other and so respectful of each other personally that society in general is really nice and accepting. So the extent to which there are harms of people have to be a little bit more considerate scale also does the extent to which people are treated well. Second of all, come mainly from then closing government. Closing government whip says that there are other norms about people that suggest you should be nice, so our extension doesn't apply. This misses the nuance of our extension, which explains that people have to make a decision about what nice means and whether or not to be nice in this instance. And we explain that counterfactually, if people didn't think that they should necessarily default to being nice in these instances, the likely ways in which they would determine whether or not to extend people's sympathy are invasive, are rude, are prying, and force individuals to then justify being treated well, which creates conversations that are bad for everyone. That response does not stand. 
The third response from closing government then is to suggest that you shouldn't be nice to posers because all posers have privilege. I'll deal with this more comprehensively when I address their case, but briefly now, the first thing I would say is that even if this is true, it makes the conversations worse for everyone. Because first of all, it means people who aren't sympathetic to the type of trauma you have are likely to have a disagreement about it. It means that people have heated discussions about whether or not your specific trauma or the reasons for why you're not particularly happy or you just want to be given a bit of leeway today should be accepted. But it also means you don't get the better type of political discussions that they talk about. Because the types of people that aren't going to accept your trauma, that is racist, that is, if, to use their example, white women, will still not think your justification is good because of the prejudices they outline. Which means that people don't change their behaviour, which means that people don't then act in the way that they say and they don't extend credibility favourably. We think it was better to avoid these conversations in the first place and not force people to identify their trans identity. To not force, for example, when I go and hang out with my friends and say, can you guys quit making a couple jokes today? I know we didn't generally like making bits, but I've just had a rough day. But then to pry in and say, but why do you really feel like you were being, you know, like someone was being mean to you or whatever? I shouldn't have to justify that. People should just be accepting they should be a little bit nicer when requested. And then the final criticism from closing government is that, aha, the benefits only apply if you actually do this. No, because even if you don't have privilege, a norm in society that says when someone is clearly upset or they're having a bad day, you should preemptively extend kindness, you should not cry, you should try to treat them well, means that individuals don't need to be the most vocal for these benefits to actualize. That defends our extension. Let's then examine each team and see how they compare. Closing government. They have a pretty good case, admittedly, uh, but I think it's got a couple of problems. The first problem is that they don't ever effectively weigh a small group of marginalised people against the totality of society. Because for their extension to work, you have to believe that there is a subset of people who are disprivileged, who can't voice their concerns, and we should never err in favour of the majority of people in society who might have privilege or don't have the lowest relative levels of privilege. And they never explain why the fears of those anxieties, why those people feeling inadequate, why those people not wanting to be extended kindness should be trumped in every instance such that we would abolish this norm for those concerns. That, I think, means on a scale they lose. But second of all, as Sam points out, all the reasons why people would not give you privilege, would not treat you well, still exist. And that means that people still continue to mistreat them. They still use those same prejudices to discriminate against those people. It's incredibly unclear why these people now being vocal and angry means they're given any more legitimacy and means they're not shouted down. Which means I think a lot of their impacts about anger simply compound. Because you're far more likely to explode when people tell you to get over it. When they force you to justify it, which our extension uniquely explains. We think if people are going to be treated badly in society, it's good to have countervailing norms that say you don't have to know what this person is going through, you just have to suggest that if they're upset you should extend them a bit of leeway. Let's then weigh our contribution against closing governments. Three points of weighing. Firstly, their benefits are speculative, marginal, and it's incredibly unclear whether or not in either world people are treated better. Second of all, I don't think they ever justify the way, like, for their extension to work, you have to believe that people always think through their relative levels of privilege to everyone else. Or well, you just don't think it's true for the majority of people, because these are incredibly personal, which means people don't default to their position and class in many instances. But in many ways, we just explain why the people that would be rude to you, that would cause the type of anger, would be involved in. I'll take someone in a minute, but I'm going to respond to opening government now. What does opening government say? Their strategy to win the debate is to explain that the process of being nice weighs on people, and so we shouldn't, you know, weigh off the few people who maybe will make bad assumptions on either side for the majority. All we need to do to defeat this is to explain why this doesn't significantly burden those individuals, and then our impacts about having worse conversations and everyone having to justify themselves outweighs them. So, their explanation is that people have to walk on eggshells and they feel guilty. Three responses. First of all, you know that this person is sensitive, which means if you try to be nice and they are still rude to you, you don't internalise that as you having done the wrong thing, because you recognise that that person is a little bit sensitive and you try to be nice, that justifies even if they're mean. Second of all, they are unlikely in the way that opening government and describes to consume a, a whole bunch of your time. Because if this person is super annoying or difficult to deal with, they're probably not embedded in your social circle. They're probably someone that you have to interact with on a relatively, you know, fucking random basis or whatever, and that explains why the actual effort required to be nice to them is relatively low. But finally, people know how to be nice and it's very easy in many instances, specifically for the reasons explained by our extension, which is that you get taught how to do this, it's very easy to identify and it doesn't weigh on people because people think they're doing the right thing. That means at the end of opening government, it's unclear that this significantly was a burden on the majority of people and there weren't other norms in society that reinforced that they were trying to do the right thing. That means that they're weighing to justify the 98% of people doesn't stand and our extension uniquely expand the scale of impact of the people of which this debate applies, which means we can counteract them also on scale. Before I go on, mm, opening.
Your case requires us to believe that one, people aren't generally nice, which is wrong, and two, being nice is sufficient for sensitive people not to get treated. Isn't it simpler and better to encourage sensitive people to develop coping skills that always assist them? Uh, first of all, people can't always develop those coping skills, so that's unclear that necessarily applies to the majority of instances, you don't prove that. Second of all, you make the same mistake as your closing, which is our extension doesn't require people to like, uh, like your words, I forgot what it was, but it's just like the rebuttal I give the closing, which was, uh, wait, what was the, the first thing? Uh, you need us to believe that people aren't generally Oh, yeah, 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 no, that's stupid, because this debate is about whether people choose to apply the concept of being nice to this specific instance. That's a mistake closing me. Let's quickly weigh against opening government. I think they fail to prove why the majority of people are significantly harmed by this, but also, their weighing seems to be people do the right thing and they get fucked for it. Our extension explains why people would act in ways that is bad, and that means the majority of people would be doing the wrong thing, so you shouldn't favour that stakeholder. Briefly on opening opposition, there are three ways in which we beat them. First of all, we expand the that they're talking about because we provide the most direct explanation for why the stakeholder they care about because people with the most intense forms of trauma would be clearly most fucked over by this but we also just explain why the majority of people now have to have laborious emotionally consuming conversations about justifying themselves about feeling for example why this is annoying it's a strain that applies to everyone it explains why society gets less kind it explains why people are less generous clearly we ought value these things we ought vote closing opposition